All right, so in three, two. Good afternoon. My name is Rod McMillian. I now call to order the meeting of the Audit Committee for November 16, 2021. The Board of Education's October 13, 2020 resolution provided that in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely. Subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present and that would allow the public to also remotely attend these those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. Accordingly, today's audit committee meeting is being held virtually. It is also being broadcast through Microsoft Teams Live. The link is provided on the board's website and board docs. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by roll call. Board members will sell their names before making or seconding a motion as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Additionally, as a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Ma or excuse me, Ms. Jamison if you must leave the room by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum may be, can be maintained. Ms. Jamison, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. I will start with Ms. Pasteur. Present. Ms. Rowe? Here. Ms. Joes? Mr. McMillian? Here. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Jamison, please call the roll of staff members participating in today's meeting. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. I will start with Ms. Barr. Present. Ms. Stevens. Present. Ms. Mana. Present. Ms. Fletcher. Present. Mr. Strait. Sample. Present. Mr. Spore. Present. Mr. Saris. Present, thank you. Mr. Fannin. Present. Ms. Boswell McComas. Ms. Shea. Are there any other attendees present that I did not recognize? I know we have two um, people from CLA, Ms. Sherry Amos and Ms. Shannon Weiss. Is there any other attendees present that I did not recognize? Uh, Dwayne Edwards, internal audit. Thank you, Mr. Edwards. Laura Hearing Crew, no internal audit. Thank you, Ms. Crew. Hearing no additional names, I turn the meeting back to you, Mr. McMillian. Thanks, Ms. Jamison. Our next item is opening remarks. I have no opening remarks. Item number two, the live video footage of our last meeting represents the meetings, the minutes of the meeting. The minutes stand approved as recorded. Item number three, our first item is the FY 2021 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. Ms. King from CLA will provide a report on this topic. Ms. King. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for your time today. Um, I am Sherry King slash Amos <laughs> um, with CLA. I'm a director um, with the firm and I have with me um, Shannon Weiss, who was the manager on the audit this year of the FY21 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. Um, I'll start off with the actual document itself. Um, the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report prepared by management. Uh, it's a pretty lengthy document, about 145 pages in length. Um, we do provide an audit opinion in that document. This year, the audit opinion was an unmodified opinion. Um, is, is the proper terminology in uh, layman's terms, it's a clean audit opinion. It's a good audit opinion. Um, the audit opinion that you have received for many, many years now, which is a, a good testament to uh, your finance department um, and the hard work that they put in to prepare it um, for the school system. The Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, if you were to flip through it, is, is very um, comparable to last year. I always recommend that if there is um, one part that you focus on, 
Um, I know it's a lot to peruse through, but the management discussion and analysis um, in the beginning of the document is, is a really good synopsis of um, what all um, transpired financially uh, throughout the school system in fiscal year 21. So um, if, if, if some of the, the accounting jargon kind of gets you a little lost, I think the management discussion analysis uh, would be a, a great read over um, if you haven't already. Um, in terms of the document, we did have um, one new accounting standard that was implemented in fiscal year 21. This was um, accounting GASB statement number 84 related to fiduciary activities. Um, the, the only real effect it had on the financial statements was um, associated with your school activity funds. These are the funds that are um, held at the each school system on behalf of the students um, for extracurricular type things, um, field trips. I mean, it could be any kind of sports, classes, proms, homecomings, things of that nature. Um, prior to fiscal year 21, um, under the older guidance, um, the school activity funds were classified separately in the financial statements. They had their own um, accounting, own page in the financial statements um, column where they were separately reported as fiduciary activities um, because they were held in a fiduciary type nature uh, on behalf of the students. With the implementation of GASB 84, it changed the definition um, and the criteria for a fiduciary activity within the financial statements. Um, and that definition hindered on um, what was um, administrative control and who had administrative control over those funds. And when we dug into it with um, finance and kind of drilled down into school activity funds, it was determined that the Board of Education has administrative control over um, writing the checks, approving the expenditures for payment, things of that nature, that that then required those school activity funds to be reclassed in the financial statements with the general fund um, monies. Um, this is just for financial reporting purposes only. The board still has separate accounting of those school activity funds. Um, as they always have done um, for tracking purposes and accountability, um, this is just how they are reported within the financial statements. Um, the implementation of this standard did require us to restate um, July 1, 2020 balances. So there is a restatement in the financial statements. Um, this was in the normal course of a change in accounting principle. It was obviously not due to an error in previous financial statements. Um, we do have an emphasis a matter paragraph in our opinion, but we still have an unmodified audit opinion for fiscal year 21. So that was probably the only significant change that we had or, or quote unquote new thing that we had to implement for fiscal year 21. Um, I want to go through some of the required communications um, that we have for management. Um, the next section is related to estimates. These are all the same as in prior years. Your estimates have not changed um, in terms of the description, but just to quickly kind of um, to go through them. Um, you do have an estimate in your financial statements related to capital assets. Um, each capital asset has a useful life assigned to that. Um, obviously, the board doesn't have a, a magic ball and know how long a building might last or a piece of equipment might last, um, but there is guidance um, from um, the Governmental Accounting Standards Board um, on what those useful lives should be that the board uses um, in depreciating um, fixed assets um, in the financial statements. The next three are computations of liabilities that are prepared by outside specialists. The first is related to your workers' compensation claims. The board is responsible for workers' compensation claims under the self-insurance program. Um, every year at June 30th, there is um, claims that were incurred at that point that were not paid out until after June 30th and you have an outside specialist that determines what that estimate is for financial statement purposes. Um, we looked at all the factors that went into that estimate, determined it was reasonable. And then the next two are actuarial estimates, the first being your net pension liability, and then your net other post-employment benefit liability. 
These are benefits that you'll pay out um, upon retirement of employees that were earned already over their, um, their working relationship with the board. Um, these are actuarial estimates that are um, provided. Um, actually, uh, they are those, those estimates are acquired by either the county government or the state government as you're in um, state or county pension and other post-employment benefit plans um, that were attained on your behalf. We looked at those valuations and the assumptions in those valuations and determined that they were in accordance with government accounting standards. Um, the next item I wanted to, to, to discuss was related to difficulties incurred during the audit. Um, as you guys are well aware, I typically um, present at the October audit committee meeting. I am a little bit of a month late this year as the audit was delayed as a result of the cyber attack um, that occurred in 2020. Um, we did have some difficulties that we worked through with manage management on obtaining account balances and analysis and supporting documentation um, related to the audit um, that took us a little uh, longer to issue this year than in the past. Um, this year we issued October 28th was our report date. There was no uncorrected misstatements in the financial statements um, that we were aware of or made management aware of, but we did this year have one corrected misstatement that management recorded um, related to expenditures. Um, there were several invoices for expenditures that were for services performed prior to June 30, 2021 that were recorded in the financials for fiscal year 22. Um, when we um, discovered those, a journal entry for approximately $195,000 was recorded to move those expenditures from fiscal year 22 into fiscal year 21, um, which was the proper accounting treatment for those. Um, no disagreements with management during the course of the audit. Um, I, I will take a, a, a brief second to thank Mr. Saris and his team um, for all, all of the help that they provided and, and, the, um, and the cooperation that we received during the audit. A um, little bit of a challenging audit this year because of the cyber attack, um, but we um, set up weekly status meetings right away and were kept the lines of communication going the whole time and it was um, have had a lot of very productive conversations and, and status um, status updates throughout the audit that were very beneficial for us. So we greatly appreciate it. Um, the other thing I, I always say too, that this audit is not just a finances of the whole um, school system operation. So we, we talked to many different people throughout the school system and um, we definitely appreciate everybody's cooperation um, and, and time that was provided to, to get us the information we needed. So. Um, thank you very much. Um, management did not consult with any other independent accountants that we are aware of during the course of the audit, um, and there was no significant issues outside of our professional relationship that was discussed with management prior to our engagement. Um, and then we did have a couple findings um, related to the audit this year that I was going to um, discuss next, but I will take a second and ask if anybody has any questions so far. Committee members, any, qu any questions for Ms. Uh, King? Ms. Pastor? No questions, thank you. Ms. Rev? I just have one. The amount of money that was um, misaligned with the year, what was that expenditure for? Those were related to capital project expenditures. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure. Ms. Joes. Thank you, Ms. King. Please for, for continue. Sure. So during the course of the audit, we did have a couple of findings this year. Um, the first um, we classified as a material weakness in internal control related to payroll. Um, one of our obviously one of the areas that we dug into was payroll expenditures for fiscal year 21. And um, per our testing, um, a couple of findings related to payroll, the first being that the board was unable to provide approved timesheets for hourly employees. Um, that was due to the cyber attack and the uh, timekeeping system Kronos being lost as a result of the cyber attack. Um, the other part of the finding is related to pay rates used to process payroll. Uh, we did note for 14 out of 22 employees that we tested 
that the pay rates did not agree to the negotiated bargaining agreements that they were in. Um, so therefore, um, there were some discrepancies in that area. Um, again, that was related to the cyber attack and, and management's um, having to rebuild um, the payroll system um, for items that were restored as a result of the attack. And we just recommend that management review existing policies and procedures and make modifications to ensure that um, those hourly employees who are paid based on hours worked, that there is timekeeping um, associated with those hours and that they're approved um, and documented to maintain um, the audit trail for payroll. And then also um, we recommend that management review policies and procedures to make sure pay rates are aligned um, with um, negotiated bargaining agreements. The second finding again was another material weakness in internal control related to accrued vacation leave. Um, throughout the year as employees work, they um, earn um, time off related to vacation leave um, through the school system. Um, some of that leave is taken during the course of the year, but the school system does allow employees to um, accumulate that time and take it um, at a later date if they so wish. So at the end of the year, there is always a liability for accrued vacation time that was earned but not used by employees um, throughout the school system. Um, we got a detail of the employees that had a liability at the end of the fiscal year 21 and completed testing over that balance. Um, during our testing, we had several findings. Uh, the first was associated to um, leave that was taken. Um, the board could not provide complete documentation to support all the leave that was taking, taken for 35 out of 60 employees during the year that would have made up that liability balance at year end. Um, the board could also not provide documentation um, for two out of 60 employees uh, related to leave that was earned um, in accordance with negotiated bargain agreements. Um, every um, employee that's part of a ne negotiated bargain agreement um, is able to earn so many hours of um, leave time throughout the year um, based on their bargain agreement and the length of service. And there was two employees where that time did not um, agree to the supporting documentation that was provided. Um, documentation for employees that to support vacation leave usage was not consistently approved. Um, and then also for one employee, the pay rate that was used to calculate the vacation liability was incorrect. Um, the, um, the amount was 3437 that was used and the pay rate should have been 5332. Um, again, this was a result of the cyber attack that happened in the management's um, having to manually go, manually go through and rebuild um, the vacation um, balances at year end and the associate liability um, with those balances. So we just recommend that management continue to review existing policies and procedures to ensure that leave earned is in, in accordance with negotiated bargaining agreements, um, that there's documentation of approved leave taken and maintained, and that correct pay rates are used um, in calculation of that liability. Okay. We had... Um, a significant deficiency in internal control related to um, subsequent disbursements and accounts payable cutoff. A significant deficiency is a little less severe than material weakness, but still warrants um, the attention of the audit committee. And this had to do with that $195,000 of um, adjusting journal entry that was made um, related to capital projects expenditures. Um, that were reported in fiscal year 22 that should have been accrued back to fiscal year 21. Um, therefore, an adjusting journal entry was made to the capital projects fund to adjust accounts payable and expenses at the end of the year. Um, and we recommend management review for policies and procedures to make sure that invoices which is received after year end are, are thoroughly reviewed and that the expenditures associated with those invoices are properly classified in the correct accounting year. Um, I think at that point, I, I, we have a management letter as well, but at this point, I think I'll stop and entertain any questions. Okay. 
on those three comments. Any questions, Ms. Ms. Pastor, any questions? Yeah, I have a question about um, the vacation leave, the second mm -hmm. one um, earned but not used until the end of the year. Um, what group of employees would fall under that? So that would be any employee that per um, board policy can um, earn and receive vacation time, but is not required to use it by June 30th. Okay, and I asked that question. I, I so, sort of knew that was the answer, but I asked that question because um, school administrators then would fall into that, correct? And they uh, traditionally don't take that leave mm -hmm. during the year. So wouldn't this, why was this a problem now when it must have shown up before um, because they don't take leave? And I'm saying that as a former administrator that almost never took leave. Sure, let me, let me clarify the findings. So every year, and this has been going on forever and ever, there is always a liability in the financial statements for this type of leave that is earned but not taken at year end. So that that part is not new. Okay. The finding is related to the calculation of that liability and um, in, in the in the calculation of the in the inputs into that calculation um, is related to the finding. So in the past, when we've reviewed that liability, we've had no exceptions to um, the inputs and the leave taken. Um, however, this year with the cyber attack, we did have findings related to um, the liability and how the liability was calculated. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Um, yeah. You, so you, the liability has always been there. That's not yeah. new. Yeah. Okay. Because the I, I, let I was, me repeat. it's the accuracy of the liability in the current year. Yes, you're very clear. Thank you. That just sure. rang a personal bell with me. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, the liability itself is not new. <laughs> right. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Ms. Rowe, any questions? Yes, so were you not, was the school system not able to calculate the liability at all, or is, is this a correctable mistake? The school system calculated a liability for every employee. We tested 60 employees that made up that liability, so obviously it's a sample basis, uh, and we're not able to fully recalculate that liability for I believe 36 out of the 60 employees based on documentation provided. So does that mean that we don't actually know how much vacation they have accrued? The supporting documentation could not be provided to verify the vacation that was accrued. Was there a reason given? The reason maybe Mr. Saris could probably jump in on, on management's response, but it was due to the cyber attack that information was lost and had to be rebuilt manually. Yes, so thanks for uh, the question. Um, what uh, we did with vacation was we did manage, although we lost uh, essentially all of the human resources data, we did recover a file um, uh, on our own uh, from a, an email. And that provided us with the October 31 leave balances for all the employees, which was the last completed month prior to the cyber attack. And the, uh, the payroll system uh, came back online January 22nd. And so we, my staff and our ERP consultant, got together uh, and reconstructed the accruals based on everybody's different labor contracts for that period at November, December through January 22nd. So we added that calculation to the October 31 balances and then we, we because people had just really been getting paid straight their regular scheduled paychecks for that 
November to January period, we went back to all the offices and said, please review, compile, and send us your leave usage records. And so that those records came to us on paper. And so with this combined leave balance that was reconstructed effective January 22nd, and all of the backlogged paper leave records that were manually key punched into the system combined to create this year end total liability. And that liability went from about 29 and a half million to about 37 million. And, and so that's an increase. And so that's something that Clifton Larson Allen notices and they wanted they 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 wanted to do some extensive testing because that's a real change in the trend. Part of that is because in an effort to be uh, to favor the employees whenever possible, given this the situation, we allowed employees to carry over leave because nobody really was working under normal conditions in fiscal 21. And so a, a, a large part of that increased liability is due to these special circumstances and the relief that we wanted to offer employees. And uh, because we had some actual records, some uh, recreated calculations and some and, and some manual paper records that had to be key punched into a system, there were lots, uh, a lot more uh, variables than we might normally encounter when everything was computerized in prior years. And, and so I think that's why uh, Miss Amos and her team did some much more intensive scrutiny of these records um, and and we feel that we have addressed the problem and that we uh, we will not have it going forward. Okay, Ms. Rowe. Yes, thank you. That was a very thorough response. Ms. Jones. Mr. George, while you're there, I've got a question for you. Sure. And, and I'm going to take the opportunity, it's the fact you're on the screen and it's, it's I think, a related topic. I had a constituent that works for Baltimore County Public Schools approach me and tell me that within his department, I'm assuming somebody in his department does payroll. So he went to that individual and they got the discussion and it, he was told that if there's any discrepancies between his paycheck and what this payroll agent or whoever this person is has for him, that it falls back on him to prove that you know his, his information is correct. Is, is that accurate? Is is there no way to double check that on on BCPS's end to make sure that that these that our workers' information is correct? Well, certainly we'll uh, investigate and have done so for any similar complaints that we've gotten. I'm not entirely clear whether his uh, the person who does payroll is is part of my staff or part of the office's staff. Um, so what we would try to do is exactly what uh, Clifton Larson Allen did in this case, which is recover all the timesheets and compare the calculations and the usage to see if the balance makes sense. And of course, if it if this dispute was with a supervisor, that's you know beyond my immediate ability to address. But if it's with the records that that we have, we'll certainly uh, review them. Okay, so so back in the day, normally the principal secretary in the schoolhouse was the one. It appeared to me that was responsible for payroll. That's so if I had, if I ever had an issue, I would go back to that individual and and present my issue. Right. But like now, as far as a board member, if, and and for years, 
I, I, you know, I just did my job. I got my check. It was direct deposit. I wasn't staying on top of that. And, and I was just, you know, I was trusting, thinking that, you know, whoever's doing payroll is doing it accurately. I didn't go back and crunch those numbers. And, and I think there's a lot of people like that. They don't double check what they're receiving in direct deposits versus what they're supposed to get. I, honestly, I had a board member tell me that, that she hasn't got paid a number of days, uh, you know, back for a while. She hadn't gotten paid. And I just, I, it, I just, to me, that's mind boggling that I would have thought the system, you know, I was trusting that the system was foolproof and it's not foolproof. So that falls back on me and my responsibilities and, and everybody else to make sure they, they check their, their deposit slips, correct? We, we uh, have repeatedly asked people to check, especially this year, and and we have identified and and uh, made a number of corrections. Um, as you know, you know some people were overpaid, some people were underpaid. Um, I believe we've corrected all of those problems, um, and we haven't actually. And just from the the high volume of people I've talked to this year because of the circumstances people are really checking um and and i mean i talked with one teacher whose husband was an irs agent and and it came down to seven cents and <laughs> and he wasn't going to go away until i could explain to him where that seven cents went so um we do we we do want to help everybody who's got a question it's just been one an overwhelming year, but I'm certainly happy to look at my side of of this complaint. Um, and I'm not aware of any board members that haven't been paid. I am aware that uh, we still are correcting and should be done here in the next week or so all of the year to date balances on everybody's paychecks so that um, they're accurate and they include that January pay before the system was uh, came back online. And while we're on this, a TAPCO official told me that there's several hundred people hanging out there with different issues with their checks and whether it's benefits being taken out or benefits not, you know, taken out, not taken out. Is that, can that be accurate? Yeah. Um, and most I got the I got the same spreadsheet um, because I had about four or five issues that were payroll related out of 300 or more. I want to say 370 some. They told me 400 was the general. Yeah, that's about right. So so the the pay the true payroll issues were relatively few, but the the bulk of those. Um, complaints were related to the cyber attack, but they were primarily um, grade and step classifications and certifications whereby teachers who had completed uh, coursework were not being paid Reverse. according, you know, to to what they believe they should be. And so, um, so the certifications office in human resources is having to do the same thing we did in in payroll and finance, which is to go back and and reconstruct all of those outstanding claims, look at the transcripts and and make those decisions about assigning the correct grade and step for the teachers. And then when they do that, they send me in payroll uh, a, a personnel action statement that says, you know, this person should have been paid at, you know, masters plus 30 from uh, November uh, 24th of 2020 to, to May 15th of 2021. And, and then we uh, issue a check for that, uh, that back pay. Okay. So there, there are many of those still in uh, 
in human resources being investigated, that it it doesn't relate directly to this audit report. Mr. George, thank you. And Ms. King, I'm sorry to throw a curveball out there. Would you please continue? Absolutely not a problem. Thank you. Um, the last thing I wanted to cover is we did issue a management letter this year as well um, with a, several um, comments in it. Um, a management letter is more of a uh, opportunities to strengthen your controls or the efficiency of your operation. So these comments are, are less severe than the, the, the three that we just went through um, that were classified as material weaknesses and significant deficiencies. Um, the first one was related to outstanding checks. Um, prior to the cyber attack, the board had processes in place each month when they um, reconciled um, their bank accounts to clear outstanding checks within the financial system. Um, when the cyber attack um, occurred, those processes were were um, were eliminated. I guess um, would be the word to use um, as a, a as a functionality of the software. Um, so several months um, went in the system where outstanding checks weren't properly cleared out um, in the system. So when we started um, the audit, um, probably around six months ago at this point. Um, several account balances, including cash, warrants payable, and salaries are pay payable, were overstated due to this inability to um, actually go into the accounting system and clear outstanding checks. Uh, management over the course of while we were um, conducting the audit was working with the software vendor to get processes in place to be able to appropriately clear those outstanding checks and made tremendous headway um, on that project um, while we were doing the audit to the point when um, before we went to issue our audit opinion had gotten the um, discrepancies down to an immaterial um, amount that that we could pass on for the audit. Um, we just recommend that management continue to work with a software vendor to clear that remaining immaterial um, balances, um, reconciling balances for outstanding checks, and then to make sure that they have processes and procedures going forward um, for monthly and timely clearing of outstanding checks in the financial system. Sherry, could I just interject one sure. comment here? Um, I want to emphasize that our bank statements are reconciled. Mm -hmm. Um, and the the uh, the the clearing of the checks is something that's taking place in our accounting software so that it uh, aligns with our bank statements. And that is a a reporting feature that we lost and we are still uh, in the process of finalizing that uh recovery feature so thank you sure sure um, i have three other comments um manage a lot of comments related to it um i do want to stop here and just um and just make sure the audit committee is aware um, that we were not engaged to perform an audit or a review or any procedures over your information technology systems. That was not the scope of our financial statement audit um, or any procedures over the cyber attack. Um, those would be separate services that we could provide for the board um, if the board would so engage us to do so, but that was not within the scope of our audit. Um, we did not place any reliance on IT systems as part of our audit. Uh, we substan substantially um, substanti substantiated the balances and transactions through significant detail testing um, versus relying on controls in your IT system this year. Um, we did have several observations as we gained an understanding of the cyber attack, the effects of the cyber attack, and um, just the information we needed to be able to um, properly perform our audit procedures. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that the audit committee was was aware uh, of the scope of our work. Um, the first um, comment is related to terminate employee access. So um, typically a formal documented review of user access and advantage HRM and financial applications is completed each year. However, um, in fiscal year 21, um, that was not um, the case due to the cyber attack. Um, we did note that there was four terminated um, 
employees that still remained active within the active directory user listing and one terminated employee that remained active with an advantage financial user listing. Um, so we just recommend that management um, continue to make um, user access uh, review a priority going forward. Uh, make sure that's formally documented to ensure that um, employees that are terminated within this um, within the school system are terminated from all appropriate um, financial and HR applications. Um, we know the board did not conduct a formal risk assessment since 2017. Um, we do recommend, um, especially um, once the board has, you know, uh, navigated through the cyber attack, that a formal risk assessment be completed. Um, and in our management letter comment, we did list um, some of the, the best practices that a risk assessment should include um, for it to be um, comprehensive um, in nature. Um, the board does not have an information technology strategic plan in place. Um, again, we recommend um, that one be um, formalized and documented um, that aligns with the overall business strategic planning. And again, in our uh, management our comment, we had some best practice recommendations of what should be included in an information technology strategic plan. And lastly, um, as a result of the um, cyber attack, um, we noted that the business continuity plan and disaster recovery plans have not been updated. Um, there has been significant changes, of course, to your control of environment as a result of the cyber attack and the response that management has taken um, to navigate through that and continue operations. Um, so we recommend that um, management go back and, and update both of those plans, the business continuity plan and the disaster recovery plan to uh, reflect current operations and practices um, in the in, um, current control environment, IT environments. And those were the management letter comments I had for today. Any and questions? Our presentation. <laughs> Ms. Pastor, any questions? Ms. Rowe, any questions? No. Ms. Joes? And I'll try Ms. Pastor again. Ms. Pastor, any questions? I have no questions. Ms. King and your staff, thank you very much for all the work that you put into this report. Thank you very much. We appreciate your time today. Thank you. Um, and I hope everybody has a wonderful holiday. Thank you. Thank no you questions. Much. I'm sorry. I was having a little <laughs> issue here. I'm a techno idiot. OK, thank you. No questions. You were very thorough, very clear. You and Mr. Saris, thank you. Thanks again. Thanks, thank everybody. you. Bye. Okay, our next item is the UHY final report. Ms. Manna and Ms. Edwards will provide an update, please. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. And okay, I see the PowerPoint slide is up. You can um, go ahead to the next slide, please, Mr. Corns. So internal audit has completed its follow-up activities for the UHY report that was final back in April of 2019. The UHY report included one finding and 12 observations. And although we previously have presented the results of our follow-up activities for the areas that were already completed, this presentation is a compilation of all the results, um, all of our results of the UHY issues. We want to emphasize that the issues in the UHY report are from April 2019, and there were delays in our completion of this project due to the pandemic but also especially due to the cyber attack and the shift in BCPS staff is, staff's focus on their activities. So our overall follow-up status of the 13 recommendations in the UHRI report is that six were determined to be implemented and seven are determined to be in process. For the implemented issues, uh, BCPS staff has provided sufficient and appropriate evidence to support all elements of implementing the recommendation. And for the in-process issues, BCPS staff provided some evidence to support partial or limited implementation of the recommendation. Okay, you can advance to the next slide, please. Related to finding number one in UHY's report, um, the report indicated that financial disclosure statements were not filed timely, 
They also recommended that the ethics review panel conduct mandatory, um, mandatory annual training. We reviewed the 2018 and 2019 financial disclosure statements for the individuals with the same position titles that were reviewed by UHY. And we determined that the corrective action for this finding was implemented. Our review indicated that only one financial disclosure statement was filed late. And although a safe schools training module was developed for those required to follow a financial disclosure statement, there's no assessment to determine if the participant understands what's being read throughout those uh, slides in the module. Additionally, there's no guidance or training regarding the use of amendments on financial disclosure statements. However, we recently learned that the ethics review panel has developed a more robust training module, and there is an anticipated implementation of that new module in um, January of 2022. Um, and although not noted in the UHY report, our review of the financial disclosure statements noted that the ethics review, review panel does not have a documented procedure for the process that a member uses when they review a financial disclosure statement. So that's something that we recommended during our review. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Duane to present the results of our follow-up activities for the UHY report observations of number ones, one through six. So you can go ahead and advance the next slide, please. Thank you. Regarding observation number one, UHY's report indicated that BCPS uses confirming purchase orders for unacceptable reasons. They also recommended that BCPS uh, conduct training to address this issue and to identify confirming purchase orders in the system. For BCPS management, this will be addressed with the financial system upgrade. This was delayed due to the cyber attack. The system upgrade and general reporting capabilities are currently incomplete, but a full recovery is projected for December 2022. In lieu of the system upgrade, purchasing is using a smart sheet to identify confirming purchase orders. We tested a sample of purchase orders identified as confirming in the smart sheet and determined that BCPS is still processing confirming POs for unacceptable reasons. Additionally, training was planned to be incorporated with the system upgrade. Since the upgrade has been delayed, we learned that management is working on alternatives such as videos and postings to the SharePoint site. Therefore, we determined that the corrective action to this observation is still in process. Next slide, please. Regarding observation number two, UHY's report indicated that BCPS lacks a formal process to periodically update procurement procedures. We reviewed the status of the 39 procurement procedures identified in the UHY report and determined that one was revised, 17 were in process of being revised, 12 had not had any uh, action taken, and nine are now considered obsolete. Therefore, we determined the corrective action to this observation is still in process. The new target date to complete the review and, revis and revisions of these uh, purchasing procedures is December 2022. Next slide, please. Regarding observation number three, UHY's report indicated that documentation for pre-proposal activities is not consistently maintained. We determined that the corrective action of this observation is also in process. Purchasing has drafted and implemented a procedure for a solicitation process, which is uh, procedure number 3210.006, but this is still to be reviewed and approved. This is one of the procedures included in, uh, in our uh, review of observation number two, which again, we've listed also as in process. We selected a sample of contracts and requested applicable documents to determine if pre-proposal activity documentation is maintained. However, we did not receive the requested documents and therefore could not determine compliance with uh, UHY's recommendation. BCPS management indicated that the grants compliance manual would be updated. We requested an update of its status and determined that it has not been revised. Next slide, please. 
Regarding observation number four, UHY's report indicated there is a lack of documentation for the procurement of activity of CNI or you know, curriculum contracts. They recommended that BCPS enhance the maintenance of documentation to ensure it's consistent with Maryland laws and regulations. We determined that the revised process used by CNI and purchasing complies with uh, policy and rule 6002 and the state article or state education article section 7-16. Our testing indicated the proper procurement activity documentation for CNI contracts was maintained. The corrective action of this observation is implemented. Next slide, please. Regarding observation number five, UHY's report indicated that BCPS has not consistently maintained documentation of its considerations for the use of cooperative contracts or piggyback contracts. Although we determined that the corrective action of this observation is implemented, we noted that the support for one of the cooperative contracts reviewed did not have the provision for use by other parties clause. This was reported to purchasing and we are awaiting confirmation of this documentation. We determined that a that the due diligence checklist used to document BCPS considerations for cooperative contracts complies with the requirements of the annotated code. Our sample of cooperative contracts validated that pre-procurement documentation for cooperative contracts was completed and maintained, except for the one contract uh, noted above that did not contain the for use by other parties provision clause. Next slide, please. Regarding observation number six, UHY's report indicated that BCPS lacked adequate documentation supporting the procurement to payment process. UHY recommended that BCPS reemphasize the importance of adhering to procedures. They also identified instances of credits that were applied to another contract with the same vendor and recommended to discontinue this practice. We determined that the corrective action to this observation is still in process. Although management indicated that staff was retrained, we were unable to verify the training occurred. For BCPS management, this issue would be addressed with the financial system upgrade. Again, this uh, was delayed due to the cyber attack. The system upgrade and general reporting capabilities are currently incomplete, but a full recovery is projected for December 2022. Additionally, we were unable to determine if a credit me if credit memo procedures were reviewed or updated. At this time, I'm going to turn it back over to Ms. Manna to present the results for observations uh, number seven through twelve. And you can move to the next slide. Thank you, Dwayne. So the remainder of the um, observations seven through twelve has to do with procurement cards. Um, observation number seven, UHY's report indicated that BCPS did not have a second level of review of the procurement card monthly statements. We determined that the corrective action to this observation is still in process. We could not determine if an annual second level review of batch packets for each cardholder was implemented. The action plan for a centralized review process was also delayed due to the cyber attack. We use the uh, new procurement system, which is JP Morgan. There, we use the reporting capabilities and reviewed um, the report that they have in the system and determined that as of October 1st, 2021, there were 515 procurement tra transactions totaling over $136,000 that were older than 30 days and not yet approved online. We determined that the new reporting capabilities that JP Morgan has are not yet used to monitor transactions and that are not approved timely and that cardholders and approving officials are not notified to correct the deficiencies noted on this report in JP Morgan. You can uh, forward to the next slide, please. Observation number eight. Um, and to, I wanted to reiterate that the follow follow-up testing for observations eight through 12 were completed and previously reported at the October 2020 audit committee men, uh, meeting. However, we're including a summary of the results and updates to these results here today. So for observation number eight, UHY's report indicated that the portion of their sample, a portion of their sample of procurement card transactions had lacked in um, review and approval by the approving official. 
they recommended that a centralized monitoring process be implemented as we described in the previous observation. We tested a sample of procurement transactions for the same staff that was tested by UHY in our old procurement card system, which was US Bank. And we identified only one of 77 packets that was not signed by the cardholder and another one packet that was not signed by the approving official. However, as we noted in observation number seven, there were 515 procurement card transactions as of October 1, 2021 in the new system of JP Morgan that were older than 30 days and not approved online. Therefore, this corrective action, the corrective action to this observation is still in process. Next slide, please. For observation number nine, UHY's report indicated that BCPS does not review the GSA lodging rates when making overnight travel and that the BCPS rates were above the GSA lodging rates. They recommended that BCPS include the GSA rate information on the overnight travel approval form. We determined that the corrective action to this observation was implemented. We reviewed the revised overnight travel forms and determined that uh, the GSA rate information is now included on the form and it also includes an area to have an explanation if the GSA rate is not obtained. Although UHY's recommendation was implemented, our sample testing identified that not all staff are compliant with the requirements related to the consideration of GSA rates. We determined that three of the 10 offices reviewed were not in compliance. Uh, what our testing noted was that two travelers didn't use the updated form, therefore they didn't document the GSA rate, and two travelers did not provide an explanation as to why the, the rate that they paid exceeded the GSA rate. And next slide, please. Observation number 10, UHY's report indicated that BCPS lacked procurement card documentation to support the transactions. We tested a sample of procurement card transactions for the same staff that was tested by UHY in the old system and identified only one of the 358 transactions tested that did not have the appropriate documentation to support the charge. However, our review of the new procurement system in JP Morgan, their reporting capabilities um, system used determined that October 1st, 2021, there were 656 approved procurement card transactions, totaling over 122,000 that were older than 30 days and did not have the supporting documentation uploaded to the system. Therefore, this corrective action to this observation is in process. Um, although not noted in the UHY report, we identified some other instances of non-compliance in our testing and reported them to the applicable cardholders and approving officials where our sample testing noted that some food purchases did not comply with the, the BCPS um, food parameters guidelines and where sales tax was paid on purchases that should have been tax exempt. Next slide, please. For observation number 11, uh, UHY's report indicated that a portion of their sample of overnight travel did not have a travel approval form. We determined that the corrective action to this observation was implemented. We determined our test work determined that the overnight travel procedures include the requirement of a pre-approval and we reviewed the overnight travel forms for the same staff that was tested by UHY and determined that all 56 overnight travel procurement transactions reviewed in our sample included the travel pre-approval and were included in their packets. Next slide, please. For observation number 12, our last one, UHY's report indicated that they identified one instance where a procurement card purchase was split to circumvent the purchasing card limits. We determined that the corrective action to this observation was implemented. Our test of a sample of procurement card transactions were for the same staff that was tested by UHY and we did not identify any charges that were split. We also determined that the procurement card procedures include a prohibition of splitting transactions. Next slide, please. So our um, report also talks about risk consideration. We identified specific risks associated with the outstanding and additional matters noted in our monitoring of the corrective action plan. We will consider these risks in the development of our annual risk-based audit plan and focus on those areas that present the highest risk to BCPS. 
And additionally, I wanted to note that we plan to issue our follow up report for the UHY report in the next few days. Does anyone have any questions? Any Mr. questions, Ms. Pa Ms. Pastor, any questions? I will. I saw that um, Mr. Saris wants to respond. I'd like to hear his responses before I ask my questions. Thank you. Mr. George. Thanks very much. I appreciate uh, all the work that internal audit did. Um, and I, I agree that many of the resources that we need to address some of these, uh, I guess we're not calling them findings, but recommendations uh, have been diverted in our response to the cyber attack as, as internal audit noted. Um, but we made some progress and I just wanted to point out that the grant compliance manual is posted to the fiscal services website um, and it's been updated through October of this uh, this year. And it's very important to have done that because, as you know, we we are working with three hundred and sixty two million dollars in uh, COVID related federal grants. And so uh, it's particularly important that we provide that guidance uh, as soon as possible. Um, the cooperative contract that was referenced without the proper documentation is uh, our focus student information uh, software. Um, that's one of the systems that was knocked out in the cyber attack. And so uh, Department of Information Technology quickly uh, moved uh, that system to a commercially available product from what had been an internally written software application. Um, and that was approved by the board. And the one piece of outstanding information from Pasco County, Florida, whose contract we used, um, was not available uh, at the time. And we've been constantly assured that it would be sent to us. Um, and we decided that we needed to go ahead under these conditions with that contract, but uh, I do expect to receive it shortly. Uh, we've touched base with them again and um, we'll get it for, for everyone concerned. Um, we have uh, there the, a particular uh, importance are these P card uh, recommendations because I've got the same concerns and the superintendent shares them. Uh, since we went to the electronic approvals for P card transactions, we do have a very high instance of uh, supervisors and they're either going to be, you know, supervisors or coordinators in an office or principals or assistant principals in schools that are not approving these transactions. And uh, it's a particular problem because we need the P card system uh, to handle the volume of work that we do. And without it, we're going to be overwhelmed in accounts payable, printing out and mailing checks. So it's important to find a way that we can make this system work. Um, and uh, and, and to impress upon uh, our management that they need to be active. Um, one of the problems we had with the cyber attack is that the interface between the bank and our uh, accounting system was also lost. So most of my staff that typically review P card transactions have been manually processing these transactions from the bank and uh, we have recently added a staff person to provide that secondary level of review that's that we would like and that everybody agrees is needed um, but there again because of that lost interface we we were somewhat deterred this year um, 
One uh, uh, comment that I don't understand was that uh, staff are not notified uh, for failure to approve transactions. I just know that as a manager, I get emails every day notifying me that a transaction occurred and also that a transaction needs to be approved and I continue to get follow ups. It, you know, every day uh, that that transaction goes unapproved. So it may be we're talking about two different things, but I do know that that email notification system is working. Um, and uh, there again with the documentation, uh, those paper transactions can be uploaded into the system and if the receipts aren't there. That's again the fault of managers. Um, and uh, I'll just say with regard to travel, uh, there's been essentially none for about 18 months. So I'm going to assume that most of the things that were documented occurred uh, more than a year ago, but we we basically removed the travel budget from everyone's offices so there may be some minimal travel but uh, just in case that question came up I wanted to address it and I appreciate the time thanks thank you Mr. George Miss Pastor okay I'm trying to exhale here and so I'm really thankful for what Mr. Saris just said well you you're still here so let me talk to you for what you just said thank you um uh, I had the same concern and that is the source of my consternation. I was following everything once we got to that procurement card because as Ms. Barr knows, that procurement card has always taken me right over the edge, not to it, but right over the edge. Take back those cards. So I agree with you about whoever the manager is, whether it's in a school, it's in an office or whatever, having that um, strong hand on making sure that um, everything is done appropriately. Now, I just want to make sure that I'm understanding this um, because I have a note, employees not being held accountable. I understand, what, I'm going to start with the, the travel, the hotel. Um, and as you pointed out, some we haven't had any travel recently, which means those instances were before um, we had our before, uh, uh, I can't even talk now, before the cyber attack and before the pandemic and all of that. Um, but it does mean that somebody or a few somebodies chose not to follow the policy that was in place. And I agree with what I think Mr. Saris um, to what he was alluding that where we have to tighten our belts is making sure that managers understand that it comes back to them and that this is very serious business. Anything that went awry after the report was given is one thing too many. So again, thank you, Mr. Saris, because I can tell that you would you understand the importance of it and taking it very seriously. Um, any of these recommendations or whatever and things that we were looking at. And I want to thank uh, Ms. Barr's internal auditors, um, even though I, I say this with a pain that you found some things that weren't found in the UH. Why? So oh, we have to be on this, but I, that's that's all I I just okay Miss Rowe any questions yes I did want to hear from Ms Barr because I wanted to know what following up on these things that are in process looks like going forward and how frequently are they checking in on these items sure so basically uh, Miss Rowe as Miss Mana indicated this is going to conclude uh, our monitoring, if you will, of the um, corrective action plan as we've done over the past two years. 
What we're going to do with the remaining outstanding items that are in process is we're going to take that information and we're going to include it as part of our risk assessment so that um, it's not going to be ignored. It's not going to be forgotten. It's going to be taken into consideration in that manner. Can you unpack that a little bit more as far as the risk assessment? Sure, uh, we are, we're actually going to provide an update on that. Can we address it during the risk assessment piece? Sure. Your question might be ans better answered there. Yeah, that's fine. OK, thank you. OK, Mr. Saris, I have a, a comment. You know, as an athletic director for 25 years, we were held to a very high standard in the schoolhouse with procurement cards and, and just something like sales tax. You know, we were, you know, drilled in us that, you know, you don't pay sales tax. And then for somebody to turn around and actually reimburse them for sales tax kind of just blows me away. Uh, and and I, I understand how it falls back on the managers, you know, because it was always somebody above me that was keeping me, you know, if, if I, you know, mishandled my paperwork in any way, as far as receipt or anything else, I was held responsible for securing that, you know, all that documentation and submitting it to the next level. Uh, so it just sounds to me like there's some managers out there that just aren't doing their jobs the way it sounds. And I'll put it bluntly. Um, yeah, and I I think this is an important point because it, it puts our three roles in perspective. So the, the policies and the procedures that fiscal services has adopted um to to serve as as best practices um are are my domain and and my uh i'm responsible for training people uh and i'm responsible for updating the guidance making sure that it's relevant um miss barr's staff comes along and and they're following up on how this what's actually occurring in the field and the missing piece here the accountability and enforcement is really neither of ours for the most part it becomes uh, any violation really becomes a personnel matter for disciplinary action and so i'm not you know, I may be uh, a rule maker and a trainer and Miss Barr may be a checker upper, but ultimately somebody has to be the heavy and neither of us really are the enforcers. So we just all have to remember that that our management team uh, needs to follow up and it's an you know nobody likes disciplinary actions but that's sort of what we're where we're going with this so i just wanted to make that point and that's the reality of it and and i just want to throw this out i attended so many presentations by gail peterson on the proper way to do the the financial piece of being an athletic director i used to joke that i've i've attended i've attended so many of these that i can do it you know, while she sat on the sideline, I could do her presentation for her. <laughs> the Dr. Jess Grimm didn't find that real funny, but uh, but I really did. You, you know, we were held responsible for those numbers. And and I'm just shocked that, that you know, other people aren't doing that for whatever well, reason. Miss Peterson is one of our great natural resources here. And I don't know how much longer we're going to have her, oh. but... Um, most, I would say that every principal would love to have Miss Peterson stop by their school at least once a week. And, you know, she does have a team. We've increased her staff to three more people besides herself. Um, but it's hard, you know, there are 175 schools and this year we had 29 changes in principle, I think. 27, 29. So there's a lot of training and a lot of support uh, that schools need. And 
it would be great if every school had a business manager, but most schools have a secretary <laughs> and some of them, you know, secondary schools have fiscal assistance and it's it's a tough environment and you know, uh, we're doing the best with what we can. Yeah, and, and Miss Miss Peterson was real serious about her her presentation, and every once in a while I could get her to smile or laugh, but she was real serious. Mr. George, thank you very much. Sure. Dr. McComas, would you like to add anything from curriculum and instruction? <laughs> well, first of all, let me just say thank you, Mr. McMillian. It's lovely to see you. We miss you in curriculum. Um, and I'll, I'll just say it's been wonderful working with the audit team. Um, and we appreciate uh, Miss Shay and I have worked diligently from day one in these positions to make sure that we are um, creating processes and procedures to document everything appropriately uh, for everyone using like um, uh, a technology format and be, prior to us everything was sort of kept hard copy and in individual files in different offices and so we're really um, quite frankly proud of our work with purchasing uh, to make sure that we are doing right by everyone um, and that all of you can rest assured that the things that we're responsible for you can trust and count on um, each and every time so I see my partner in crime Miss Shea is with us of course I'll give her an opportunity uh, to, to comment as well. Just echoing what you shared, we're grateful for the time and that one word in green implemented felt really, really good. <laughs> so thank you to the audit team for their partnership and guidance. Um, a lot of hard work, but it's um, something that we're really proud of and I'm grateful to my team for working on. So thank you for the opportunity to have that uh, stamp of approval from the audit team. Yeah. Curriculum and instruction. <laughs> we we agree. And just on that, Miss Pasture, I'll just let you know that Miss Shea and I um, and our fiscal officer Denise Brock, we work hard to make sure that we properly onboard and train people to the documentation process. Um, and so we have not forgotten our professional learning uh, that you always make sure that we ask. So. Um, so thanks, Mr. McMillian, and invite us back again sometime, and uh, we miss you in curriculum, so see you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see, Ms. Manna and Mr. Edwards, I'd like to thank you for that presentation. We're going to move on to the next item. Our next item is unfinished business. Ms. Manna, we're going to ask you again to provide uh, an Office of Legislative Audits update, please. Thank you. This presentation does not have a um, PowerPoint to go along with it, so uh, it's just a quick verbal update this time. Um, we have completed uh, follow up activities for five of the 11 findings in the OLA report, which is dated back to November of 2020. One of the corrective actions was implemented, uh, and that was regarding the purchasing of school buses. And four of the findings were related to IT, and we determined with Jim Corns that they are no longer relevant due to the cyber attack. The structure of the system has changed and most of the system controls have changed and therefore these findings have been mitigated. Three of the OLA findings are similar to UHY findings and the implementation status of the corrective actions were all determined to be in process for the UHY follow-up. So we're gonna take a closer look at those to make sure that all of the areas identified in the OLA audit um, is, is covered with the testing that we have already done. And then we are also currently working to obtain an update of the remaining three corrective actions. And we plan to communicate and present more details related to our follow-up activities for all 11 of the findings, and we'll present a final report to the committee once that is all completed. Any questions so far? Okay. Any questions, Ms. Pastor? Okay, Ms. Rowe? No, thank you. Ms. Joes, if she's checked in? Okay, Ms. Mann, please continue if you have anything else. That is it for the OLA update. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Yep. Uh, next is new business. First, Mr. Fletcher will provide a report on investigative statistics. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. And Mr. Corns, did you receive the 
the PDF document. I sure did. Give me one sec to uh, switch over to it, okay? Certainly. Thank you. So while we're waiting for Mr. Corners to load this up, um, as we discussed at last month's meeting, uh, we did change the formatting of it, uh, of, of this report. Uh, last month, we presented the uh, first quarter results. And so this month, we left it in the same format, but obviously we're only talking uh, about the month of October. Uh, uh, Mr. So Fletcher, upon uh, trying to open the link you sent, I don't have permission to it. Okay, uh, I'll tell you what, I'll, I will go ahead and just share. Let's see. I apologize for that. No, no worries. You should be able to just share right over top of me and then it should uh, make your screen appear. OK, I believe I'm now sharing the. The investigative unit um, FY22 October 2021 report. OK, can everyone see that? I'm sorry. Yes, it's on the screen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so again, as I was mentioning, we, we did change the format uh, last month and. Um, again, last month we were presenting quarterly information this month we are presenting just for the month of October. Uh, so I wanted to roll through that um, and, and present that information to you. So here you just we're talking about again uh, only for the month of October talking about any cases that we received and closed during the period uh, as well as the, the status of the current investigations. And this first table we're going to talk about the cases that were received uh, for the month of October. And so we did receive 14 cases. Um, during the month and of those 14, eight were kept by internal audit um, for our own investigation. One was referred to management for them to investigate and provide the results back to us. Um, and then five were um, uh, cases that were not going to be investigated at all. So we were able to uh, document them with a memo to file. Uh, we do break down uh, the categories for the eight that are kept by the Office of Internal Audit. And you can see we have one conflict of interest, two falsification of records, uh, four payroll fraud or overtime abuse, and then one uh, is actually classified as employee behavior. And so in our next table, what we're going to talk about is the, the status uh, of all the cases that we have received. And so as of the beginning of October, so at the end of, uh, of the uh, previous month, previous quarter, we had 31 cases open. You can see a breakdown here on this first line. Um, and then we do go through uh, periodically. There are going to be instances where uh, cases are reclassified, whether uh, it's a matter of we, we get in and start to do a little bit of, of investigation or um, after um, evaluating some of the, the information provided, uh, what we may have initially thought would be something that we would keep uh, within internal audit, may really be for management or um, maybe a memo to file. And so uh, we did have um, six, or I'm sorry, seven cases that we did reclassify uh, this month. And so we will see numbers in this, this row here periodically. Um, and uh, as they pop up, we'll, we'll certainly discuss them each time. Uh, and then here we talk about the cases that are, were received in the month of October. Again, it was 14 cases. And so we see the eight, kept by audit, uh, one sent to management, and then the five that were memo to file. Uh, so combining the 14 that came in along with thir the 31 that were previously open at the end of um, the, the prior month, we did have 45 cases uh, open throughout the, the month of October. Um, and then what we have here on this next part of the table, we're going to talk about what we actually closed. Uh, during the month of October uh, very briefly. And so three um, internal audit investigations were closed, two management investigations were closed, and then we did close a memo to file uh, to give us six cases total closed for the, the month. Um, and what that re results is, uh, results in, so the 45 open cases take out the six that were closed, 
And at the end of October, we had 39 open investigations. Uh, and you can see the breakdown here. 20 were within internal audit. Uh, six have been sent out to management. We're awaiting their responses. And then 13 are our memo to file that, that we're uh, going to close. Our next table, table three, talks about the uh, 23 open investigations. Again, I'll scroll back up here briefly. Uh, we're going to talk about these 23 here uh, that are internal audit investigations. Again, mentioned that we closed three of them and 20 are open at the end of the month. Um, and, and this information is out uh, on board docs. Um, and so if the actual detail is here. Here are the three that we closed. And then here are the 20 that remain open. Um, at the end of October 31st. Then our next table is going to be same exact information, except this is going to be for management investigations. And so, as I mentioned before, uh, we closed two uh, during the month of October, and two of the the six that were closed um, are right here. And then that leaves us with six um, current management investigations that we're awaiting responses back for. And then the final table is the memo to file. Um, cases that are going to be memo to file. Again, one of the six. So here's the one that we did close. Uh, and then the um, remaining 13 uh, that were mentioned above. Here's the information for them here. Um, and we will go through and close those. So again, uh, I know this information is presented different than, than what we have in the past, but it is more familiar or more similar to what we've done uh, or what we did last month in, in that um, quarterly presentation. Um, so with that, Mr. McMillian, I turn it back over to you for any questions. Okay, Ms. Pastor, any questions for Mr. Fletcher? Not at this moment, thank you. Ms. Rowe? No. Uh, we'll give Ms. Joes an opportunity. Okay, and I do not have any questions for Mr. Fletcher. Okay, next. Ms. Manna will provide a report on risk assessment. Ms. Manna, please. Actually, Mr. McMillian, it's going to be Mr. Fletcher and Ms. Manna is going to assist as needed this time. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Fletcher? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, so again, at last month's uh, meeting, we were able to provide a presentation on the overview of our risk assessment process um, and a uh, current status as of that meeting um, and really this is just an update and so as of uh, or since that last meeting what we've done we we're able to complete the risk identification of every department and office um, which will help us prepare for the next level of interviews with the executive directors and below which is what we're uh, in the process of doing now again keeping in, in mind we are talking is so it's 26 departments and 72 offices uh, throughout the the school system that we are working our way through uh, so we have scheduled some of these interviews, uh, currently working on scheduling additional interviews, um, sending email information, e email confirmations out to executive directors, letting them know uh, that this is on the horizon and, and that we will be contacting them. Uh, so once when we conduct these interviews, what we're, we plan to do is discuss uh, the identified potential risks and any controls that are in place to mitigate those risks. Um, and again, those risks are tied back to, to those areas objectives. So it's the risk that would prevent them from accomplishing those objectives or goals. Um, and then what controls are in place to, to mitigate that. Um, so also uh, be identifying processes, functions within each office uh, so that we can rate the risk factors uh, for each of those, uh, those functions. And going back, um, I believe it was to, to Ms. Rowe's question uh, or point earlier, uh, it's at that point when we go through some of those risk factors will be um, the the prior audit results, um, the the resolution of those results, things of, of that nature. And so we are able to take that into account as we go through and and hit each of those areas. Uh, so the risk rating of each function with, within each office will be the basis then for our risk assessment, uh, and will help us guide. I'm sorry, will help guide us to ensure that our audit plan is providing resources where. Um, that we really face the most risk as a school system. And again, I, I know we've mentioned before, but we, we plan to continue updating uh, the progress of the, of the project at our future audit committee meetings. And with that, Mr. McMillian, I do turn it back over to you for any questions. 
Yeah. Miss Rowe, does that answer your question? Yes. OK, any other questions? So with the risk assessment, how do you know that your assessment tool for risk assessment is taking in consideration the things that um, are necessary if it happens that like audits and things come up with other things that you didn't catch? I guess that's what I'm looking for is like, I don't understand how your assessment tool works. OK, so we start with the the and, and we just it doesn't matter which area you pick, but but say we're, we're now talking about an office. Uh, so we want to look at that office, uh, their goals and objectives, what the things that they are designed to accomplish um, their processes. And so with that and starting there and again, all that is able to then be tied back to uh, the compass. Um, tied back to the blueprint. But starting there, we're able to then evaluate and say, OK, what risks could pop up that would potentially prevent that goal or objective um, from being obtained or that process from functioning properly? And from there, it's a matter of saying, OK, what controls are in place to prevent that from happening? Um, so payroll is an easy one, right? It, it's OK. The, the goal is to make sure that that payroll is completed timely and accurately. Uh, and, and I'm speaking of very, very big generalizations. Um, and so one of the risks could be that um, uh, ghost employees are put in, fraudulent employees are put in, things like that, uh, or just inaccurate information. And so we would take that back and say, OK, what what controls do we have in place? And the controls may be, um, you know, audit logs, of of change logs of of um, uh, employees that have been entered. Um, it could be a review process. Um, again, controls can be preventative or detective, so it, it could be a review process that um, will only. Uh, I'm sorry that that the supervisor will then verify any changes that go in, or it may be a two step process where I can enter so much information, but then a supervisor has to approve it in order for that that employee to be a live employee to, to receive uh, payment. And so we go through and that's that's part of our interview process that we're going through now uh, to, to really hone in on. And, and again, keeping in mind, we start at the high level with the superintendent's cabinet. Now we're getting down um, to the executive directors and, and local managers and um, directors of, of offices to really identify, OK, what is it? What is the, the nitty gritty that is done on a daily basis? Uh, what is the the essence of this office? What is it that's being accomplished? Um, so that we can really focus in on the the true important um, uh, controls, risks, um, and obviously uh, taking it all back to the objectives. Does okay, that? So, would you say then that it sounds like to me, just to explain if I'm right or not, that is opposed to the previous system, which is a little more complaint driven, that you wait for the calls to come in and then you investigate those complaints, that in addition to having those complaints, that you're actually having this more proactive process that goes out and attempts to predict what might be a problem before we actually have findings. Well, and, and keep in mind, this is completely different from investigations, right? The, this but is, is that, the, that kind of right? I'm sorry? Is that right? Right, so the, a risk assessment would would essentially allow us to dedicate the resources towards what what are identified as higher risk areas. Yes, if that answers your question. OK, I think I understand. Thank you. Certainly. Ms. Pastor, any questions? I do. Um, uh, Mr. Fletcher and um, Ms. Barr, what I'm hearing here, so if I'm completely wrong, then jump in and stop me so I don't continue on sounding like a clown. But um, what you're doing now in terms of risk assessment is uh, what I think Ms. Rowe just said. It's very proactive. And this is why I see your department, if no one else does, I see your department as being such an uh, important factor as we go into blueprint because you're almost um, taking a look at 
what we're doing before the AIB gets to assess it and possibly find some uh, areas that where we're uh, are going awry. And so I see Mr. McMillian as this audit office being critical to where we're going. Um, and you, Mr. McMillian and Ms. Rowe has read the blueprint. Um, so you know that not everything that seems to be common sense on some levels um, that you, or for example, staffing, I'll just use that um, in terms of the latter, that you would think would be a part of it are not necessarily a part or not a part of it. Um, some funding areas that you might think are a part are not. So it's going to be critical for every school system to be able to categorize those things which really do fall under the auspices of blueprint and those things that don't. And sometimes it's a slippery slope. Sometimes the, the lines are blurred and we don't want to get to the point where the AIB comes in and goes, hmm, and what I think I'm hearing just a little bit of under risk management is the possibility that your office can sort of abate some of the traps that we have. That was a long thing to say. No one stopped me, so I'm taking that as I'm on the right track. Yes, Ms. Pasture, you are 100% correct. It is much more proactive. Um, and, and keep in mind, the risk assessment is a, a live document. It's a live process. And so as risks change, which, which we've certainly seen over the last uh, 12 to 18 months, risk can change at, at a daily pace sometimes. It, it enables us to, um, to stay current with those risks. And then not only that, but then also can say, uh, bring potential changes to our work plan back to to you as the audit committee and say instead here's where we initially plan to go but because of what has happened risk wise we we need need to now potentially reallocate some of these resources correct and as we're as we're conducting the risk assessment we are incorporating uh, uh, blueprint into that that is the nature of some of our questions um, that we're asking directors, managers, et cetera. And it's not only the AIB that is gonna, going to come out and do their assessments, but also MSCE is going to send out um, what they call expert teams. So one of the ultimate goals is to be very proactive and to um, identify those, those elements or um, factors, things that they would be looking, looking to, um, looking for when they come to our organization and again, be proactive to say, almost like do, do a, a mock um, AIB review or a mock expert team review and provide that information back to um, those owners that need that information if there are corrective actions that would be required prior to the, the actual reviews being conducted. And if I may jump in to say, um, I'm glad you brought in um, MSDE because remember the AIB team just met for the first time yesterday and so those two groups have not come together about their look for's so systems are going to be like this trying to process um, hopefully they, they will at some point I'm sure they will um, so that they 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 are very linear in their thinking and their look for us. But just in case one is looking for something the other isn't, your office certainly gives an opportunity for out to support the system in making sure we're ready for both camps. Correct, and I have had uh, some discussions with Dr. Williams, and he has indicated to me that. Um, Dr. Wisted is our, our liaison and that our, our office is able to reach out to her and uh, coordinate some efforts. Okay, thank you. Thank you to Mr. Fletcher, Ms. Manna, and Ms. Barr for that report. Uh, now, next, we're gonna go to Ms. Barr and she will provide a report on the Efficiency Review Work Group. Ms. Barr. Sure, just a, a brief overview background of how we got here. 
As you all know, Public Works issued their report uh, without affording the same opportunity to me as they did some others. I've written a rebuttal and submitted it to Dr. Williams and to uh, Mr. McMillian as the Audit Committee Chair. And as you'll recall, Mr. McMillian at some of our board meetings requested that our office be afforded the opportunity to participate in the work groups. To that end, we have our two audit managers uh, have been assigned to a work group that also consists of representatives from organizational effectiveness, uh, human resources. There's also a Uniserve rep and an elementary school principal um, assigned to the work group. And the work group was assigned to review the recommendations uh, related to internal audit, risk management, and the external audit function. And the work group has met twice already and is scheduled to meet two additional times between now and the end of this calendar year. I believe the last meeting is scheduled for December 21. The work group was advised to not, not to address any matters related to personnel or board policy. And uh, I think it's important for you all to know that the results of this work group is going to be brought forward to the audit committee for its consideration and approval and then uh, probably that will then carry forward to the full board and then after that occurs those results will then also be submitted to the blueprint work group um, after the committee and the board have reviewed and approved the results of the work group okay any questions to miss barr miss pastor no thank you miss rowe no, that answered the questions I had. Great. Miss Joes, just in case she showed up, Miss Joes. OK, and I have no questions for Miss Barr. Great. Uh, the next meeting of the audit committee will be on Wednesday, January 12th, 2022 at 4.30 p.m. Is there any further business? May I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Ms. Thank Pastor. you, Ms. Pastor. May I have a second? Second row. Thank you. May I have a roll call vote, Ms. Jamison? Ms. Pastor? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Thank you. Since there's no further business, the meeting is adjourned. I sincerely hope everybody has a wonderful holiday season and see you on January 12th. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a great holiday, everyone. Thank Good you evening. Happy holidays to all. Thank you all. Goodbye. Bye.